Good morning and welcome to Unity Presbyterian Church. I'm glad that you're all in worship this morning. My name is Pastor David and I want to welcome those who are here in person. I also welcome to all those who are live streaming. I'm glad that you're here. And all the kids who are trickling in from the gathering area. I'm glad that you guys are here too. Uh, this is your first time. A very special welcome to you. I hope you'll fill out the bottom of your bulletin, that connect card. You can turn it into the Welcome Center because we would love to know that you are here. All right, we've got some announcements to start our morning together. The first is that next Sunday is the first Sunday of the month, and that means breakfast. So if you want to come a little bit early, breakfast starts being served right around 8.30 right here in the Fellowship Hall. If you've not ever had it before, it's by Jack and the Breakfast Crew, and it is delicious. So again, that's next week. Come early at 8.30. Also, the Latte Bar is back, and the youth run that, and it's right here in the Fellowship Hall. Um, we encourage you to visit them and get a latte. They've got many flavors, including vanilla and mocha and pumpkin spice. It's a really great way uh, to just enjoy your Sunday morning. And then we mentioned last week that we have hired Jeanette Amutis to be our children's ministry assistant. And I'm really excited for Jeanette to be taking that role. Uh, Jeanette will be partnering with Pastor Dana. They've got a lot of big plans for the children's ministry. So stay tuned for those forthcoming announcements. Every year we run a golf tournament. And so I'd like you to save the date. The golf tournament is on November 7th. If you would like to sponsor a hole, or if you would like to play in the tournament, please contact Keith Sipe, or you can call the church office and we'll get you connected. It's at Cowan's Ford, and it is such a fun event each and every year. We'll be having a reception for Bailey Beam next Sunday. Next Sunday is her last official week here at Unity, and we want to just celebrate her and say thank you to her for all the good work that she has done in this community. So that will be in between services in the Fellowship Hall next Sunday as we celebrate Bailey Bean. And then you may know that this church really leans in to technology. And so our communications director, Janine, is going to share with you a little bit about what that looks like and how you can get involved. Welcome, Janine. Thank you. Good morning. I have a lot of fun trying to make sure there's multiple ways for you to know about things from our newsletter. I hope you're signed up and you get that in your email every week. I hope you're checking our website for things. And we also have a church app, and we haven't talked about this in a while, but you can see on the screen behind me, um, it's available on Google Play or iTunes. And once you download that, it's actually called Church App-Tithely, and Tithely is our church database that kind of runs everything we do around here. The last frame on the side is what it looks like. So you can go there. You can, if you can make a church account and see the directory so you don't have to call us for telephone numbers and things. You can watch the old sermons. You can stream live. There are so many things you can do. It will give you a news feed that comes from Facebook. Uh, sermon notes, if you're sitting here and you didn't bring a pen or you don't want to write, you can pull it up and just tap fill in that on your phone and everything. So it's a really great tool to have in your pocket. So the church is with you all the time. And I encourage you to download it. And just if there's anything I can do to help you get better connected, let me know. Thanks. Thank you, Janine. She mentioned we also send a newsletter out every week. And so if you don't receive that, but you'd like to, just call the church office and we'll get you set up with that. All right, we have a couple of prayer requests. Uh, please keep in prayer Chris Easterling. Uh, his father, Bill, passed away this week. We also pray for Stacy Combs. Her father also passed away, and we're praying for you, Stacy. And then please be in prayer for Bailey Beam's mother. Um, she received a kidney transplant this last Monday, and that's really good news. And now we're just praying that it is accepted by her body and that uh, she can recover from that. And so that's where Bailey is this morning. She is with um, her mom as she is recovering from that surgery. 
our musician, Vanessa, uh, is ill today. She couldn't make it. And so Janine said, well, I can do that. I can lead worship. And I go, Janine, can you do everything? Which I think is accurate. And so our guest musician today is Janine, and we're so excited for that. Thank you, and welcome to worship. Will you stand up and sing with me? We'll all be the guest musicians this morning. <laughs> we are continuing on in our sermon series about strange stories in the Bible. And so this morning, the image that we'll be focusing on and meditating on is the picture of the mountaintop here in the middle, where it looks majestic. Throughout scripture, there's all kinds of monumental things that happen on top of mountains all kinds of things where God leads his people to a mountaintop so that he can change them and transform them and speak to them. And so this morning, Pastor David will be focusing on when Jesus is on top of the mountain and how Jesus becomes transformed, transfigured, and how God shines his glory upon him. And so for us this morning, let us think about where those mountaintops are in our own lives. Where is God trying to lead us so that he can speak to us, so that he can shape us and transform us into the people that he would have us to be? Let us pray. 
Father God, we come here this morning seeking your presence, yearning to hear your voice in our lives, wanting to be changed and transformed so that we can be closer to you, so that we can follow in Christ's footsteps more closely. God, we just ask that you would help us to hear your voice. Help us to allow you to change us. God, we know that can be a scary thing sometimes. And so help us to be shaped and transformed by you. Amen. this time if I can have our children to go ahead and start coming forward and as they are coming forward please stand up and greet your neighbor
this morning I brought a bag with me. What, is it, what do you guys think is in my bag? Apples. Apples. No, that was yesterday. Yep, some of my stuff. So what I brought with me is something. Nope, not a game. Transformers. Do you guys know about Transformers? Okay, tell me what the Transformers do. They turn into robots. I know, it's this super cool cartoon where there's these ordinary cars, ordinary trucks, sometimes a plane, and then all of a sudden, they transform into a robot. And these robots have superpowers, don't they? What are some of the superpowers? That's a good sound effect. Laser beams for eyes. Yeah. Uh, yes, lasers. One of them can shoot a blizzard with their hand. I would be making it snow everywhere. There's another laser beam axe. So they do all these things so that they can protect their friends, so that they can protect their city. So transformers are pretty cool. Well, Pastor David, in just a little bit, he's going to talk about this story where Jesus is hanging out with some of his friends, just hanging out, and then all of a sudden Jesus is like, let's go on top of the mountain. So he takes his friends up to the mountain, and up there Jesus transforms. His face becomes shiny, and his clothes are dazzling white, and literally you can hear God's voice say, this is my son. And he has all these superpowers. Yes, his friends were the disciples. And right? And he's a giant. He's very powerful. So his friends realized that he wasn't just ordinary, that he had these superpowers. That's pretty cool, huh? So essentially, Jesus is a transformer. Long story short. <laughs> All right, well, let us pray. God, we are so grateful for your son and for the superpowers that Jesus has. We're grateful that Jesus loves us. And will always take care of us. Amen. Years ago, I got to spend a week uh, teaching in Kingston, Jamaica. Uh, it was a large group of us, and we were in a school, and the school for a week allowed us to teach about the Bible. Uh, we could teach about God's love and God's plan for all the students in this primary school. It was called Golden Springs Primary School. And part of what we were teaching was um, Bible memorization. And each class had a different verse that they were supposed to memorize. And by the end of the week, they kind of shared their memory verse with everybody else in the school. Oh, I took a video of, of these students sharing their memory verses because I, I found it so important and, and so transformational. And I want to share with you one of those videos. So this is one of the younger classes reciting their Bible memory verse. Uh, let's go ahead and see that video. So, in case you couldn't hear all the words, it was today in the town of Bethlehem, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Lord. And they had actions to go along with the Bible memory verse. Well, standing in that room and recording that video, I could feel the presence of God. It was one of those moments, and I know you've had them in your life, where there's no doubt in your mind. You go, God is here. I can feel God's presence. God is right here, right now. There was something about all these kids from a country that was different from my own reciting scripture. And not just any scripture, but reciting scripture that a Savior has been born for you. For you, the people of Jamaica. For us, the people of America. Yes, a Savior has been born for all parts of the world. I still get goosebumps thinking about being in that classroom that day. 
And so I wonder, as we begin our time together this morning, when's the last time you have felt like that? When's the last time that you felt God's presence near to you? And that you can say without a doubt in your mind, oh, I feel God here with me. Perhaps it was at birth of a child or a grandchild, as you held that child in your arms and you just felt God's love and compassion surround you in that moment. These are incredible experiences. But I fear that as Christians, we tend to think that they're few and far between. That maybe a couple times throughout your life, you'll have that moment where you just know God is with you. But I don't think it has to be like that. I believe that we can actually grow in our awareness of God. And so that as we grow more and more aware of God's presence— we'll have more and more of these types of experiences where we just know or we just feel God being with us. So to teach us kind of how to get to that point, we're going to study a passage um, from the Gospels where Jesus is meeting with three of his disciples and he's teaching them something profound about the presence of God. So we're going to start in Mark chapter 9 and here's how it begins. Six days later, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up a high mountain to be alone. As the men watched, Jesus' appearance was transformed, and his clothes became dazzling white, far whiter than any earthly bleach could ever make them. All right, so Peter, James, and John, they acted as a bit of Jesus' inner circle. There are numerous occasions throughout the Gospels that Jesus took them aside for particular training and instruction. Well, this time, Jesus leads them up to a mountaintop to be alone, and that's where something incredible happens. Jesus is transformed. You heard how Mark described it. Mark said his whole appearance changed, where the disciples, they could tell it was Jesus— but they could also tell that something was different. Jesus looked different from any moment he'd ever looked like that before. They said his clothes, his clothes were dazzling white, whiter than they'd ever seen before, whiter than any earthly material could ever make it. This scene was so significant that three out of the four gospel accounts recite this scene. And so I went ahead and I looked at Well, what does Matthew and what does Luke have to say about this scene? And I really enjoyed reading those accounts because they got a little bit more specific. Uh, Let me give you an example. Here's what Luke says about this scene. Luke says the appearance of his face was transformed and his clothes became dazzling white. Okay, so Mark was a little bit more general. Mark said his appearance changed. But here Luke's getting a bit more specific. He says, no, specifically it was his face. His face was transformed. But we still don't know how, do we? Well, how was Jesus' face transformed? And that's where Matthew helps us. Matthew gets even more specific. Matthew says, his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Do you see how they're all just trying to use human language to describe what it is that they saw that day. It's an incredible scene, a stunning mountaintop-type experience where Jesus' face shines like the sun and his clothes become as white as light. But we still don't know why this happened, do we? Why did Jesus' appearance change? What was the significance of what the disciples were experiencing that day. Well, that's what we're going to explore in a second. But before we get there, there's a little bit more to unpack. As the story goes on, we could say the plot thickens a little bit. Here's what happens next. Then Elijah and Moses appeared and began talking with Jesus. Okay, I know what you're thinking. What? Elijah and Moses are here? They died several hundred, if not a thousand years before this scene took place. So how are Elijah and Moses 
beside Jesus right now on this scene? What is going on? Well, let's unpack it a little bit. So Moses and Elijah are two of the most famous and well-known figures in the whole of the Old Testament. In Judaism, Moses became known as the representative of the law, meaning the Ten Commandments, as well as the covenants that God made with God's people. And so when you thought of the law, you thought of Moses. And in a similar way, Elijah became the preeminent prophet of his time. When you thought of a prophet, someone who spoke for God, you often would think of Elijah. This became so true that then people in the New Testament, when they began referring to the Old Testament, they would start using a nickname for it or shorthand. They would simply call the Old Testament the law and the prophets. Jesus even does this. In Matthew 22, he says, all the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. What he's saying there is he's using the nickname for the Old Testament, saying, yeah, all the Old Testament hangs on these two commands. And so what's happening here is that Moses and Elijah are representing all of the Old Testament. It's like in this moment when Jesus is transformed, when he is shining like the sun, it's like they're saying everything in the Bible that has been leading up into this point is now being fulfilled by Jesus. Everything in the Old Testament, the law, the prophets, everything that you learned about God up until this point has been leading somewhere. And it's been leading to this point on the mountaintop where Jesus is now transformed. You see, in the Old Testament, the glory of God was always depicted as shining light, as this brilliant color. And so Jesus on the mountaintop, he's not just with Moses and Elijah, but he's shining because God's glory is shining through him in that moment. That's the significance of what is happening on the mountaintop. And it's significant to his disciples too. Because up until this point, the disciples saw him as an ordinary man who could also do miracles. And they were trying to figure out how that all worked together. I mean, they saw Jesus, and when Jesus became hungry, he would eat, just like a normal person. When Jesus became tired, he would sleep. But in this moment, at the top of the mountain, Jesus is transformed to show the full power of God on display through him. It's like the veil between heaven and earth is being removed just for a second in this transforming moment on the top of the mountain. Okay, so now that you've imagined this scene in your minds, I want to show you how someone else imagines this scene. There's a painter, Peter Rubens, who painted the transfiguration in 1605. So take a second and just look at this painting. See what attracts your eyes first. Where does your gaze go? And I want to then highlight a couple of things in this painting. I think the first thing that draws your eye is, of course, Jesus in the center. And around Jesus is this radiant light. It, it's actually shining down into creation. And then you've got these two figures on the left and the right. On the left, you have Moses. And we know that because he's holding the Ten Commandments, which means that on the right you have Elijah. And then right below Jesus, you've got these three disciples who have fallen down at his feet. They are witnessing what's happening, but they're covering their eyes because they know what they're witnessing is something that they have never experienced before. So I bet if you heard that someone was going to paint the transfiguration, you would expect that top part, wouldn't you? But what Peter Rubens does is he expands it down to this bottom part. And this bottom part is what is happening off of the mountain, below the mountain, while Jesus is being transfigured up top. You might remember a couple weeks ago where we studied a story 
of the nine remaining disciples. So those nine disciples were left at the bottom of the mountain, and a father, right, depicted right here, brings his son who is suffering from seizures. You remember that story? And he brings him to the disciples, and he asks the disciples to heal him, but they couldn't do it. Do you remember that? And so Peter Rubens depicts these side by side to really make the point that without Jesus and without God's glory being displayed through Jesus, like on the top of the mountain, then the rest of creation, the rest of humanity, and these disciples, well, they're powerless without the power of Jesus. So I thought that was a really interesting way to depict what's happening here. But for us, what the transfiguration represents is it's meant to show that through Jesus, the full power of God is on display. Now, I wonder, as I read through this story, I wonder what did those disciples, what was going through their minds when they experienced this? Peter, James, and John, I mean, you saw in the picture they were falling down on their knees. But what were they thinking? Well, we're actually told a little bit of what they were thinking. So the Gospel of Mark, well, Mark wasn't up there, right? But we believe that Mark got the majority of his information for writing the gospel from Peter. And so it's as if Peter is sharing this story and Mark is writing it down, which I think then is really fascinating because when Mark describes what the disciples felt, he describes Peter. And here's what Peter says. Peter exclaimed, Rabbi, it's wonderful for us to be here. Let's make three shelters as memorials, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And then I love this is Mark's commentary. He said this because he really didn't know what else to say, for they were all terrified. Are you the type of person who, when you become nervous, you end up talking more, even if what you say doesn't really make sense? That's Peter. I mean, Peter doesn't need to say anything in this scene, but he feels like he should say something. And so he comes up with his idea. Well, he says, well, should, should I make three memorials for you guys? In other words, we can all kind of spend the night here. I can make a structure for Jesus and Elijah and Moses. He's saying this because he doesn't know what else to say. He is terrified of what's happening here. Because, again, he's used to walking with Jesus, the person, who can do miracles, but has never looked like that before. He's never changed like that before. And Peter doesn't know what to do with that. So I think he speaks for all of the disciples to say, I don't know what's going on here. Well, he never gets the chance to build any memorial or to commemorate the situation, because as he's speaking— a cloud comes and overshadows the top of the mountain. If you've hiked in the mountains before, particularly if you go out west, you know how quickly storms can move in, right? Where you can be hiking and then all of a sudden the clouds start taking over, and then you can't see anything in front of your hand. Well, that's how I imagine this scene, because we're told in Mark 9 verse 7 that then a cloud overshadowed them. And a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. Okay, again, use your imaginations. Put yourself in this scene. You've just seen Jesus transformed in light. You see two people who have died since return. And then you're being surrounded by this thick, overshadowing cloud. And if that's not enough, then you hear a voice, and it's the voice of God. And the voice of God speaks through the cloud and says, this is my son whom I love. Again, we need to go back to the Old Testament to find out what's the significance of a cloud. Why is God speaking through a cloud? And if you study the Old Testament, you'll learn that God often spoke through the clouds. Think back to when Moses first received the Ten Commandments. 
Where did Moses receive the commandments? He was called up to a mountaintop, right? And when he was on that mountaintop, a thick cloud overwhelmed the top of the mountain. And then God spoke to Moses through that cloud. In the Old Testament, God often spoke in this way. And just as a fun fact, can you remember what happened to Moses when he came back down the mountain? His face shone like the sun, so much that he had to put a veil on. Do you remember that story? So there's a lot of parallels between what's happening here in the New Testament and what happened in the Old Testament in the book of Exodus. It's like this story is bringing to completion what began in the book of Exodus. But I want to focus for a second on God's words. This is my son whom I love. Do those words sound familiar to you? Have you heard them before? Well, if they do, it's with good reason. Because Jesus, or sorry, because God said those exact words when Jesus began his ministry. So Jesus began his ministry with his baptism. And during his baptism, at the very beginning, we were told that the heavens opened up and a cl- then a, a dove descended, representing the Holy Spirit, onto Jesus. And then God spoke, saying, This is my Son whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. We can see that in Matthew chapter 3 as he remembers that scene. So what's happening here is that God's voice now acts as bookends to Jesus' ministry. Because right at the beginning of his ministry, in his baptism, God said, this is my son, right? This is who is going to change the world. And now in this scene, this comes right near the end of Jesus' ministry. When Jesus goes down that mountain, it is a very short amount of time until he's arrested and until he dies on a cross. And so, once again, God the Father is reminding the world, this is my Son, whom I love. Except this time he adds a caveat. Listen to him. And then we're told suddenly, when they looked around, Moses and Elijah were gone. And they saw only Jesus with them. All right, this is a strange story isn't it? Which is why we're including it in our Strange Story series. But it's also one of my favorites. It's a story that's full of symbols and signs. This is a moment where that veil between heaven and earth is being removed, and the glory of God is shining into the world through Jesus Christ. It's a significant story in the scriptures. But what I wonder is what does it mean for you? What does this story mean for you today, 2,000 years later? Because you are not one of those three disciples up on the mountaintop, experiencing the radiance of God in that moment. But that doesn't mean you don't get to see God today. That doesn't mean that you don't get to experience God's radiance today. I believe that there is much that is sacred in our world. Now, it may not be as blinding as it was in the story that we just uh, discovered today, but I believe it will be just as evident if you're paying attention. So the call to action for us in this story truly is to begin to pay attention to God in our world. Where do you notice the sacred in your life. I think that's a good starting point for us. Where do you notice the sacred? Or, if we're being honest with ourselves, do you often just feel lost in the trivial of your life? Or are the non-essentials taking up the majority of your time? The ancient Celtic tradition has a term, uh, thin places, I've mentioned it before, so you may remember it, but thin places, they referred to the places where heaven and earth seem to touch. It's this idea that, well, okay, we often think of heaven and earth as as extremely separate things. It's like, well, I'm on earth right now, 
but someday when I die, I'll be somewhere else in heaven. But the Celtics said, well, kind of. But there are moments where you go through life and you can feel God. Where you go through life and you have that sort of experience where you go, God is present right here. And those moments, they said, those are thin places where that barrier between heaven and earth seems to be very thin. Those are the moments that we can really recognize the sacred right here in our world. Maybe for you, that's a moment where you're out in nature, and all of a sudden the breathtaking beauty of God just captures you, and it feels like a thin place. You go, oh God, God is here. But what I want to encourage you to understand is it doesn't have to be just those sorts of once-in-a-lifetime experiences. Every day can be an experience of God present with you if you search for those, if you're attentive to those, if you have eyes to see. Again, they're not going to be like a mountaintop every time because we don't live on the mountaintop. It would be nice if we did, wouldn't it? It would be nice if we just every day had mountaintop experiences where you go, whoa, God is, is present in my life in a way that I cannot deny. But that's not the case because we live at the bottom of the mountain, don't we? But in our day-to-day life, you can still pursue those thin places, those places where you just know God is here. But what I think we need to do is we need to get our minds focused in that direction. Too often our minds are wandering or focused on other, the more trivial, non-essential parts of our lives. But what would it look like if we geared our attention more to the presence of God? The presence of God that is here in our world and in our lives. It's seeking more of those places where you experience God's presence. And that's going to be different for each and every one of us. I believe we all experience God's presence a little bit differently. So it's about you pursuing what that looks like in your life. It's those places where the holy and the human meet. It's those places where the the beauty of our world, as well as the brokenness of our world, collide. We can experience God on the mountaintop. But we can also experience God when you're standing over your kitchen sink. If you have eyes to see. Amen.
God wants to meet us on these mountaintops, these thin spaces, so that he can shine his glory upon us, so that he can shape us and mold us and just pour out his goodness upon us. And when we leave those spaces, when we leave those mountaintops, as disciples of Christ, we are called to share that goodness with other people. And so our time of our offering is a time to think about how God has lavished his love, his grace, and his goodness upon us, and how we might share that goodness with others. How can we help others to experience those thin places and draw them into that sacred space as well? Let us pray. Almighty God, it is a gift and a privilege to be able to have a relationship with you. It is a gift and a privilege to know that you always seek us out, that you draw us to these thin spaces so that we can experience you. And God, we know and can attest that in those times, we are transformed. And your glory shines upon us. God, we just pray that you would help us to take that goodness and that glory out into the world. Help us to be your hands and feet in this world. Help us to draw other people closer to you. We pray all these things in your son's name, your son who taught us all to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Okay, stand one more time and help me as we sing our last song.
Now, whether you go into this week feeling like you're on the mountaintop or the valley, go and seek God's transforming presence, God's radiant light in all that you do. Go in the name of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.